schematic model of an error correcting code. Um, in this in this code, qubits are, are arranged on the links of a square lattice, and there are two sets of operators that we consider acting on this system of qubits. There are these A-type operators, uh, also called plaquette operators, which are composed of products of sigma Z's acting on the four qubits that surround that plaquette. Um, and there are also these B-type operators, which I'll call vertex operators. Um, these are composed of products of sigma X uh, measurements acting on the qubits surrounding a particular vertex. Um, the, all of the A operators and all of the B operators commute with each other and are therefore simultaneously diagonalizable. And moreover, uh, each of them has only eigenvalues plus or minus one. Um, if we take the set of states that yield a plus one measurement upon uh, measurement of all of the A operators and B operators, this forms a code space of, uh, of the model. Um, and in that code space is where we encode our qubit information. Um, this promotes these A and B operators to what are called stabilizers. Um, and they're called stabilizers because uh, if we measure any of the A or B operators on uh, a state in the code space, they always yield a plus, or, uh, plus one measurement. If we, and so this uh, gives us a scheme where we go in and repeatedly measure the A and B operators. And if they turn up a minus one measurement, that reveals the presence of an error. Um, and this, this is the scheme that we, uh, we use to implement the error correction in practice. There, uh, the lot, this code has a very important property though, that the logical operators, which are the um, exit, uh, which are the products of X, uh, sigma x is acting on a string that circumnavigates the, uh, the torus or a product of sigma z that circumnavigates the torus. Uh, these logical operators cannot be generated through products of these a or b operators. And that's important because when we go in and repeatedly measure these a and b operators to locate uh, any errors present, we don't want to accidentally measure the information embedded in the top level because that would, uh, that would destroy. Um, I want to point to a comparison between the Torah code and the Honeycomb model that we studied. Um, they both have interesting Hamiltonian forms, both formulated by Kaya. Um, in, this, in the Honeycomb model, um, if we take the Hamiltonian, which is composed of the sum of each of these uh, Eisen-type interactions on, uh, on the lab, um, depending on the strengths of each of these uh, interactions, we can tune between either a gas or a gasless CT spin rate um, The analogous torque Hamilton, which is the sum of these A and B, of these global A and B operators, um, this is actually also a Z2 spin rate And it is actually, it is exactly in the Z2 gauge degree of freedom of the ground state of this torque of Hamilton in which we encode the topological qubit of the analogous error correction code. And so naively, you might think that since both of these are Z2 spin liquids, um, does the honeycomb model have also have an analogous error, uh, useful error correction code? This actually turns out to not be the case. Um, the first reason is that because the checks of the honeycomb code all anti-commute with each other, um, we can't use them as stabilizers in an error correction code because measuring two anti commuting operators won't tell you anything about uh, whether or not an error has occurred. We could try to be clever and instead of using those two body uh, check, uh, checks as stabilizers, use products of these checks that do mutually commute everything as stabilizers. And indeed, there are such products. Um, first uh, type are these contractible loops. Um, if we use these contractible loops as stabilizers, um, that works. And uh, we actually, instead of measuring these, the full six body plaquette operator, we could just measure all the two body checks in a loop and infer <coughs> a value uh, of the measurement of these plaquette operators. Uh, that could work, but the problem is there's a second type of loop that is also generated through products of these two body checks. And those are these non contractible loops that wrap around the torus on which the qubit sits. This loop here is exactly the topological uh, degree of freedom that will be measured. Um, and so the problem then becomes if we try to measure all our uh, two body checks in order to discern the value of these plaquette operators, that would in turn destroy the logical. Um, so 
therefore, the honey the honeycomb system naive, naively fails as a stabilizer uh, as a stabilizer. So this seems, seems kind of hopeless, but maybe, maybe there's a way we can be even more clever about it. And instead of just measuring everything at once, measuring all our two body types at once, perhaps we can measure measure them in a particular order, um, in a way that doesn't destroy our top level. Um, so this is something that Hastings and Hahn did a few years ago, um, in which they they uh, uh, came up with a prescription of a periodic scheme of measurement that does measure all the checks of the honeycomb code without uh, destroying the top level. Of the um, in their model, they tricolored their honeycomb lettuce, and every round they measured checks that only connected hexagons of a particular type. So we were loosely inspired by this model, um, and we asked, um, is this a feature of just this, uh, this particular prescription of measurements, or can, can we recover something similar in a, a, uh, in a model of just measuring things randomly? Um, randomly with some kind of bias, but still um, not everything at once. Um, and indeed, that's what happens. Um, in, a, in our system, in our in the aerial updating mode model, uh, because we're measuring one type of weight much, much more frequently than the other two, um, we never uh, the probability of accidentally measuring all checks that wrap around the torus sequentially is exponentially suppressed in system size, and therefore the lifetime of our top level qubit um, is long lived over the day. Right, and so this this is. This is <laughs> kind of exciting because this points to a group of creating quantum codes in uh, the non equilibrium city settings that are both random but also have a public qubit that is uh, well defined and, known, and we know how to access it through uh, its logical algorithm. Uh, so, in conclusion, um, the toolbox we have a large variety of tools in uh, open system many body dynamics, and we can engineer all sorts of very interesting phenomena. Um, this, what I showed you here, is one such example uh, where, through, through the use of measurements, which are only available in the setting, we can not only um, engineer interesting new phases of entanglement, but also create these uh, dynamical quantum codes. Um, and in the future, uh, we would be very interested in studying whether or not these models can be implemented experimentally on uh, NIST platforms such as uh, superconducting qubits, uh, processors, or full data systems. Um, and we're also interested in um, studying these models in the presence of noise. Um, with noise, we need to uh, come up with these new decoding schemes that handle the randomness of the um, And so that's something we'd also be interested in. Yes. No. I 
Okay, so I have the honor of presenting uh, Juni to you. Juni was my postdoc advisor, so it's like a triple, triple honor. Um, so June uh, is a fellow at Jilla and NIST in Boulder, and also a professor of physics at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Um, if you don't know already, I will tell you that he's made many, many breakthroughs. Um, throughout the realm of quantum optics and AMO physics, um, really pioneering breakthroughs um, in precision measurement, quantum science, ecology, um, multiple matter. Uh, he did his PhD with Jan Hall at um, JOA, um, and with Jan, he made some of the crucial contributions to the development of the frequency cone, which was the subject of the Nobel Prize that Jan and Jan won in 2005. Um, I met June when he was a postdoc, a Millikan uh, postdoc at Caltech and Jeff Kimball's group. 
And, um, and then I became a postdoc with him after that. Jun is the author, and this sounds crazy, but I guess it's true. He's the author of almost 400 papers. Um, I didn't know that was possible. How many of were written by that? <laughs> <laughs> Um, and he, he has too many awards to comprehensively list because we actually want to hear him speak. Um, <laughs> but uh, okay, so just to summarize, he's one, he's a member of every organization that I can think of. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a member of like Stanford. Yeah, he's not too far. But, um, he uh, he's won the, the Roddy Prize and the Ramsey Prize, so you definitely know that he knows how to do measurements. Uh, uh, President Obama selected June um, uh, for the Presidential Rank Award for sustained extraordinary accomplishments. That's a pretty cool citation. And just recently, uh, last year, in fact, he won the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. And so the last thing I wanted to tell you, and that's amazing. Uh, the last thing I want to tell you, because you're a room full of graduate students and postdocs, is that June is an amazing advisor uh, for both PhD students and postdocs, and has just an enormous number of students who've gone on to uh, found companies, to go to staff positions in national labs, and faculty um, at various universities around the world. Um, that's really the, the most glorious achievement. So, <coughs> June. Thank you. Thank you so much. Since the uh, introduction makes me, uh, I was sweating. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, uh, um, but it, I have to say, it's just amazing to come back to Stanford you know, to, to see the old friends here uh, and Bob, I, <laughs> and, and uh, it's a, such a glorious place. It's so beautiful and you're doing so, so much wonderful science. I already spent a day here yesterday with the chemistry department that could get a talk there about molecules and so on. I, I'm really glad to be back here and, and hopefully in the next uh, 50 minutes also share with you some of the recent work that's going on in Boulder with but I want to really emphasize a point. This block is much beyond a piece that keeps time, but it's really where we explore quantum science. And it, and it uses this to probe fundamental physics uh, and the transmitter side of things, like probing emerging phenomena. So we all know that the fact that there's two form that where everybody is here and they're talking about quantum science. We all know that it's a very exciting time where if we want to put Push the position measurement frontier, as Ben said. You know, we want to be able to measure things uh, well. That is really getting at the point where quantum science frontier and measurement science frontier are coming together. And if I just talk about clocks, um, we have some pioneers sitting in this here in this corner about spin squeezing stuff. And, and if you design a quantum system, you want to have a very long coherence time. Uh, so, so some of the ridiculous quality factors like. 10 to the 17, uh, showing you, you know, within its lifetime, how long this coherence of the vision can oscillate. We want to build a system with many, many quantum particles. They can enhance the so-called spin and quantum limit that scales with the square root of the particle numbers we have. But of course, nowadays, many, many of us are not thinking about once you can create quantum many body states, well, maybe there's quantum resource entanglement and you can start to use to go even beyond this and there are a number of pioneering experiments going on in the field. So think about this clock, and as in Ben's introduction about Dan Hall and so on. If you think about it, over the past three decades, and many of the technology come out of the standard uh, pioneering work, uh, quantum control, quantum state synthesis has allowed us to achieve this incredibly high quality factor of transitions. New laser technologies are allowing us to build lasers with coherence time nearly approaching a minute. Frequency comb allow us to synthesize electromagnetic fields can actually have many unexpected applications for even for medical science. <coughs> Quantum gas has brought us this main body states that we can be thinking about entanglement and so on. So all of these things, if you think about it, over the past two or three decades were frontiers of science. But for clocks right now, these are just corners from the technology. And you actually have to use it you know, as a component of building clocks that are currently achieving accuracy of the few plus to the 18 and the measurement precision of few plus to the 19. But the field is moving really fast. 
just over the past two or three years, this precision has been improved by a factor of 50. It's not sitting at a mid 10 to minus 21. The accuracy, I think, is everything else has been calibrated to a low 10 to minus 19 level, except dark body radiation, which, which is in the being, being characterized. So these numbers will be quite important as we try to redefine the base I unit of second unit. But also the precision stuff we can already use is for fundamental physics research. So talking about the coherence time, I just want to give you a sense of where we are. You know, if you think about this coherence, the superposition of S P orbitals of something atoms, and you think of this as a pendulum, it's oscillating period on the order of a frame per second. If the if the atom such as strontium, you can put it in a coherent superposition and lives there for 120 seconds. That's the 10 to the 17 quality factor I'm talking about. And so this is on a very microscopic scale of time evolution of electrons around nucleus. If you think about macroscopic scale of the time, well, that's the whole the lifetime of the whole universe. That's the 10 to the 18 seconds. And so you can think of this 120 second happens to be exactly the geometrical mean between the the, the pendulum oscillation of one time per second versus the macroscopic time of life of life of the universe. It just means what, what that means is just mean like our technology now allows us to sit at this midpoint that would allow us to reach this very microscopic time scales and a very macroscopic time scale. So that, that's what I feel the most excited about the quantum physics allow us to make these very precise measurements that the testing to allow us to probe the holes in our understanding of the physical universe. And so if we have such a quantum pendulum, indeed, you can imagine immediately that a system like this, if I build it, uh, it won't lose a second of the entire age of the universe because it's always the midpoint of the dramatic But in order to be able to read out these such a quantum scapes position, you of course need to have good technological tools. John and I were talking this morning, uh, he, he, he and I both love cavities, love, love technology. Like, Technology is the one that driving science forward. So the technology is this white sinusoidal wave, which is a laser. You, you've got to make a laser stable enough to be able to read out this coherence of this, this quantum pendulum velocity back and forth. You have to build very stable lasers to be able to build it to talk. And unfortunately, with the material science, we have come to understanding what kind of material we want to use to build up quantum parameter. In this case, the silicon crystal happens to have very high mechanical Q. And we all know this official fluctuation theorem. If something is mechanically lossless, you will have less fluctuation. So the big young modules make this material less sensitive to vibration. Uh, and it happens to be, if you cool this crystal down to 124 Kelvin, it goes through a zero for no expansion point. Mm -hmm. And so at that particular temperature, it neither expands nor shrinks, at least on the first order of right? the expansion. There are actually three different uh, zero positive points of selection. So it's quite interesting. Uh, we have been collaborating this with the German standards lab PPE over the past 15 years. And there were multiple cavities now built in Java and the PPE. And if you bring two of these cavities together to pair, here's a feed node between these lasers stabilized on these cavities. So it's just a few millimeters standards at a 4.5 micron. And this would indicate optical coherence time approaching a minute. Or you can think of a system like this, you can actually, if you build an interferometer between Earth and the Moon, and you will be able to have this light going back and forth to so 100 round trips, and we'll still be able to know which peak or which chop you are sitting on the second part of the oscillation of the optical field. And the advent of the optical frequency comb technology, I'm not going to do justice, but just one, one graphic here to show that the very simple basic idea is. Well, this sinusoidal oscillation is happening at optical frequency. You don't have a lot of electrons to come back. But if you can somehow make a pulse laser where the period of the pulse uh, between the successive pulses is a sub integral multiples of the field oscillation period, then you can actually translate this optical frequency down to the microwave. You just have to know how many periods you have in different pulses. And that's as simple as you can say about frequency comb. And the technology of the ultra fast lasers allow us to do things like this now. So you can translate an optical frequency into microwave frequency and vice versa. 
In fact, the fuel is much more versatile. If you have a stable laser, as you that's the cavity, you can transfer, you can essentially transfer the phase phosphorus anywhere within this optical spectrum. The physical spectrum scan by So let's come back to the on the side of the matter on the atom. And the simplest possible way to do laser cooling, the simplest possible tracking form is just having a laser like I held hold in my hand. And they just have a virtual reflected by a mirror and can establish scanning wave. The scanning wave has anti nodes. You can have trap, we can have atoms <coughs> as of them trap, and it looks like a stack of 10 gigs, and each one of them can have hundreds of atoms, and uh, and, and you can have you know, 10,000 of those pancakes. So you can imagine you have a million atoms trapped in these systems <clears> like this. Ben mentioned uh, my postdoc time with Jeff Kimball. And it turned out, you know, this natural wavelength idea actually came from Cavity 3 d This was when we were working together trying to get a single atom trapped in with my Jeff. The idea being, you want this trap international not causing heat. Uh, in, in when he's doing heavy duty work. So, this came to this idea that suppose these are two atomic states you want to do work on, whether it's heavy duty or it's clock. You want to create the trapping potential, which is a spatial homogeneous uh, AC structure, which that allow you to trap the atoms. But you want to create the trapping potential to be identical between the ground state and the excited state, so that when you do precision measurements between the two atomic states, that's of course the clock transition. It's not being influenced by the fact that they do you know this trapping potential here and you will have AC structure, potential AC structure. So it's a very simple idea. The question is how well you can make those two trapping potentials be exactly the same. And that's been hard. In fact, that problem has not truly been solved even today. But this is, I just want to squeeze in a slide to show you where whether we are accurately evaluating this so called lattice structure. The idea is creating these two trapping potentials to be the same. But it comes out, you know, the differential frequency shift between these two trapping potentials when atoms are quantized in these trapping potentials, it depends on the so called E1, this dipole approximation, the E1 dipole, how that scales with how that varies with the frequency. And are you sitting exactly at that magic point that's at the tuning? And so this is just talking about the actual dipole approximation. Well, there is also nonlinear effect. The, the atom can respond to I squared, and this is called hyperpolarity, which is the beta. N zero represents the quantized emotional states in, in this, uh, the direction that it's tightly confined. <clears throat> and then the most troubling one is there's that uh, if you want to go to the such high precision, just looking at natural dipole approximation is not enough. You actually have to think about magnetic dipole transition. Electrical particle transition. And that's this little term alpha, alpha QM that's never been evaluated carefully enough. Um, so, fortunately, as I will tell you a little bit later, that we cannot make a trap very, very weak, uh, almost just a few photon recoils. You can still sustain atoms against gravity. And by taking the trap to such a low depth, and as you can look into these data points, we can finally fit this complicated waveform. Uh, the, the formula of the AC structure and to really evaluate these individual items. The contribution, for example, that's what that quadruple magnetic type contribution is now being evaluated with uncertainty of 1.5 to 19 and so on. So finally, we are getting this down to a few plus 10 to the 19. It just shows you know, some good idea that's out there, but if you want to really let it uh, grow in the precision measurements, you have to take it. Many years of a systematic evaluation. Initially, it was at 10, 15, now you can finally go down to the end. And so, coming back to this magic wavelength idea, right, the, the, the key concept really learned from trapped ions is to this, the separating the internal degrees of freedom, G and E, if you think of the pseudo spin pack system, from the external degrees of freedom, which are emotional states. That NZ represents this quantized motion of the freedom <coughs> We can do that. Um, then you can do this very basic spectroscopy work where the central lines of the carrier transition that phonons neither gain nor excuse me for gaining phonons. 
Then love is the only one that's not making pronouns into the lies. Our lies does not have pronouns, but it's the composition mode. You can gain, gain the composition mode for group side game, or lose the composition uh, in the so called red side game. But because of the temperature of the, the atoms in the lattice is, is sufficiently low, they are mostly occupying the, 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 the ground state. Therefore, the red side game is suppressed. The, the asymmetry between red and blue side game tells you the temperature. We can, of course, cool this down further, such that this can be completely suppressed. But if you look into this carrier, this is a very beautiful right line shape. And, and this really indicates, you know, the Doppler effect has been all quantized away. We can ask ourselves, where's the Doppler effect all? What went into the blue side and the red side? In the carrier, there's no, there's no, it's being squeezed out. There is no emotional effect anymore. And we'll come back to the Talk about this point with, with the optical lattice. You can squeeze out the output effect. Later on, you can squeeze out uh, the interaction effect and so on. So, this is a kind of a, a good setup where the output effect is gone. The recoil frequency um, in the absorption spectroscopy is gone because this has to be confined. We are doing sort of a land dipping regime. The trap AC structure of the trap uh, frequency is gone. So, that the precision can be improved by many hundreds of thousands of atoms. But very quickly, as we move along with a clock like this, we start to see interacting many body physics. In some sense, that's great. That it's actually studying many body physics is, is an interesting area intellectually. At the same time, we actually have to solve these problems because otherwise it will get systematic issues in the blocks. <coughs> So suppose I focus onto a central tank gate with a dozen of atoms there. Now I start to do clock preparation. Remember, this is a pseudo spin half system, which you can think of a spin down, spin up. And you put atoms in coherent superposition somewhere in the middle. We all know there's uncertain difference of all, or there's a so called quantum protection noise. Before you make a measurement, you don't know where the atoms will bounce to the side state. And that's the uncertainty. That's why there's a little fuzzy ball. Or may not be here. This is not a, not a foreign concept to you. You deal with this in the lab like every day. <coughs> These atoms we pick to be fermions, and so for a pair of fermions, the total wave function has, has to be anti symmetrized. <coughs> so if you are driving the internal spin degrees of freedom, being sort of so called a triplet, the GE plus EG is configuration, <coughs> external degrees of freedom that describes emotional states in the transverse direction that must be anti symmetrized. And this is what you call a key wave interaction for fermions when average is sufficient to emerge. So that's, that, that gives you any momentum of one each part. And in, in, in the 2D configuration, it turns out this key wave interaction actually very briefly depends on the quantization of the emotional contact in one and two. So that means you can actually now think about this as a collective spin with a total, total spin basically nothing but. Total number of atoms times half. And that's collective spin. These are indices can be sort of removed. And you, you can start to have Hamiltonians, which is I S Z squared S Z is a projection of the spin along the Z axis of this fictitious clock sphere. And this is what we all call single axis twisting. And you can use this to actually study the quantum noise become non-classical. Indicating these quantum fluctuations of these things become correlated. This was back in 20 to 10 years ago, and we were really hoping to use this to the spin squeezing experiments. I think uh, Monica was just, <coughs> just graduated with his PhD in, in the Laden School of the Spin Squeezing at the, at the time, and we were very interested in introducing spin squeezing into clocks at that time. But we had to wait 10 years before we could actually really finally do spin squeezing in the clocks. At that time, I felt, well, this is interesting to look at Heising models and some of the blocks, but it's introducing some sort of uh, noise into the system and systematic shifts. So we would move on. We said, well, why don't we design a 3D clock, 3D lattice? In this particular case, if the temperature is low enough, every atom occupies only one lattice site because these are fermions, so you only have one atom per site. And it feels like it's a scalable quantum system. If I can put it, you know, a lattice with 100 by 100 by 100 in three dimensions, I think accommodate a million atoms with coherence times 120 seconds, you'll be able to build this amazing clock, uh, four times 10 is 20. 
And I remember at the time, I was thinking about these experiments in 2016. Mark and uh, Jason and so on and Stanford came up with ideas of using strontium to do atom interferometer, using those clock temperatures, and, and it, you know, to detect gravitational waves and so on. And I was thinking about, well, if we can make a clock at this level of precision, 100 seconds later, you would be measuring something that is 10 minus 21 differences. And that's the sensitivity needed to see gravitational waves. And you don't need an atom interferometer anymore just compared to clocks when a gravitational wave comes. So you can see where there's these ideas that are cross fertilizing. At that time, we had a clock at 10 minus 16 level. And over the last six years or so, we have pushed this now to give us 10 to the 18 at a one second. They still have several orders managed to go, but just feels very exciting as we move along this direction. And, and I will tell you a little bit about these, these numbers in a few minutes later. But, but I also want to stop, you know, to just really make a point that our field is very friendly, collaborative, you know, there was a friendly competition going on. But ideas like this actually gave, and I remember sitting in Nisha Lucas' office, you know, talking about this, we do this, when Adam Kaufman was looking for jobs and coming back to Jilla. And Adam Kaufman, Manuel Andrews, and so on, Caltech, very quickly turned this into a new sort of optical tweezer clock with strontium atoms, which we're combining these individual optical tweezers. There's some tweezers from some here now. Um, and just amazing how uh, with these optical tweezers, you can control individual atoms, you can address them individually, you can entangle them, and so on. So now you can see how the clock experiments and a metaphometry for quantum computer platforms and so on, kind of merging into a single system and really pushing the frontiers of imaginal science and quantum science. So, coming back to the 3D lattice, I talked about quantized Doppler, we cannot talk about quantized interaction effects. I think, unlike this single pancakes where there are some distinct interactions going on there. But, well, first of all, you can see the emotional effects you have now three set of side bands. There is three dimensional confinement. The red side bands are completely removed as atoms can cool down to the ground band. Um, it turns out the strontium 87, the fermionic strontium 87, has a nuclear spin of 9 half. So there's 10 different nuclear spin states. But those nuclear spin states do not involve themselves into electronic interactions because those clock states have j equals to zero. All of that kind of momentum is zero. So I of j equals to zero. That means these atom, these colors can can tell you apart, can tell apart these atoms are different because they're different sitting in different nuclear spin states, but they do not play a role on how you interact with each other. And this is called it, so-called SU in symmetry from our theory colleagues. And it turns out this is really nice because if you look at the transition, this is the so-called clock transition where you have one atom per side. If you have two atoms per side, you see two set of side bands with all these different colors. You will say you should be able to see many, many side bands because there are different combinations of colors that can come along, but they all collapse onto two side bands because of the basic symmetry. Um, and why there's two side bands? One is actually anti symmetrization on the electronic, which we don't call anti symmetrization in the nuclear. Remember, the total wave function has to be And that's why there's two different. And in fact, why stop at two? You can put three atoms, four atoms, five atoms in those on a single side. And you can always see any the pair of atoms, the pair of side bands, whether it's two atoms, three atoms, four atoms, five atoms, because of the SU symmetry. As a, as a clock maker, though, the most important thing is N equals to one. When you have that one atom per side, it's well isolated from the rest of the right atoms. So even if your sample is not prepared to completely swing your nuclear swing pure, you still don't have to worry about the correct effects at 10 minus 22 level. We can also recently actually using a single spin, we created a so-called three-dimensional band insulator. This is really indicating that you have one atom per side in the middle, it looks like a flat flat hole. That's because you cannot put a more, more than one atom per um, that side here. And you can Combine this technology of being able to do very high spectral, uh, spectral uh, very high resolution spectroscopy and very high resolution spatial imaging. Uh, putting this together, you can, for example, uh, apply magnetic field gradient across the sample 
And then, of course, each atom now can interact with a block laser slightly differently. And you can actually record this atom laser coherence in, in, in this atomic ensemble and so on. This, this is already telling you you can use techniques like this to measure the field gradient extremely precisely. And later on, you can use this to measure gravitational potential um, and the gravitational redshift and so on. Another really interesting <coughs> uh, aspect, excuse me, is actually looking at this turn this into a dipolar physics. And this was actually a really interesting story that I first met Misha Lukin uh, when I was a very young uh, faculty member. I remember 2003. Misha was a very young uh, faculty member. We were both attending a meeting at IQEC in Moscow. And it was my first trip to Moscow, the, the quantum. Uh, yeah, the yeah, National Academy or something. Uh, and uh, we don't know each other, except there's a professor Ladikov, who is a famous guy in nonlinear optics. And Nisha was with Professor Ladikov, so I approached him and said, Professor Ladikov, uh, Jan Hall wanted me to say hello. And uh, and, uh, and then uh, Nisha was, ah, oh, you are Jun Yi. And, uh, and we started to talk about it and said, Nisha, eventually I can build a nice clock like this. And and Nisha is incredible, you know, this this guy. He said do you have to worry about dipole dipole interactions? This was back in 2004. <laughs> and, and, and I said, Misha, maybe yes, but probably will take a while. <laughs> <laughs> but these dipoles are one micro divide. Uh, you know, these are clock candidates. That's why you have 127 coherence on exceedingly weak dipole. I know that some of you are thinking about the you know, super radians, strongly dipolar couple of systems. But it turns out with clocks, once you get to this level, you drive the clock transition. Now you have to worry about this retarded potential EPI here over here off. And this, the, you've got hundreds of thousands of atoms there. It's going to have some measurable effect, you know, that you turn on it. And what's interesting also, you can turn your clock laser at a different angle. You can actually look for the Bragg diffraction and so on, or construct the interference of these radiated dipolar coupling. This is just showing a little bit of the dipolar radiation pattern, how this can be drive driven with phase shifts across the different colors. So I just want to tell you, you know, it's actually becoming an incredible system like when Dickey, this is called a Dickey model, when Bob Dickey was thinking about these atoms individually confined somewhere in a fictitious way to classical textbook, and he asks the question about super radiance or collective land shifts. We cannot do those kind of experiments with clocks. So, as I mentioned, the transit cycle is about micro divide. There will be 10 to minus 19 frequency shift. That's why in 2004, this was so ridiculous to think about it, because at the time, the clock was not existing, but the best clock at the time was 10 to minus 13 or so. But it turns out this is actually important systematic uh, once you get to the 10 to minus 19 level of frequency shift. And we cannot measure this. Uh, uh, we can, in fact, we can measure it and we can tune it to zero. So we can actually drive for well, we two different transitions. One is nine half to minus nine half to minus nine half, or minus seven half to minus nine half. They get different clutch clutch volume coefficient, meaning you can tune the dipole moment. And whether you use this um, high transition or, or or cinema transition, you can see the frequency shift of the cooperative land shift scales exactly with the clutch volume coefficient squared. And that's a dipole dipole interaction. And this. 29 degree indicates what angle of the k vector with respect to this cubic uh, crystal. And you can actually tune this angle, and you can see the frequency shift goes really large, goes to zero, and goes, goes to negative. And this can be just measured. So you can actually tune this dipolar shift to be zero if you wanted. What really was this to study this collective dipolar couple of And in fact, uh, it's even more fun is this, these dipoles are relatively weak, right? Those are like one gigahertz transition with dipole and on the order of a microhertz, or micro divide, excuse me. But we can actually use another laser, just like Rydberg coupling, like just a two order monica <coughs> you're talking about Rydberg coupling. If you think about it, you can just couple it from zero to single P1 with a magnetic transition with a 1.3 micron, coming with a different angle, so face matching, with a different angle in this clock crystal. You can make this dipole transition much, much stronger because there's actually little dipole moment between single S0 or single P1. That dipole moment is huge in the body. And you're mixing a little bit of wave function of the triple P0 to enhance it. 
<coughs> this means that if you have now the opportunity to turn on dipole interaction with just turn on the small point three micron laser, you have dipole interaction that's much enhanced, as we can see in any other dipoles pointing up or pointing down. You can actually this image is looking at the frequency shift as a function of the spatial distribution, as a function of the k-back that's propagating there. And you can see the, the dipole pointing up, the shift is on the right hand side, the dipole pointing down, the shift on the left hand side is like completely visible at a, at a scale that much bigger than the last time. So perhaps I'm going to come back to the screen screen because this is the Emotional scar in 2013, we were trying to do the spin screen and failed. So I was like always thinking about can we do spin screen? And, and this is the idea, you know, maybe in the future we could just use this to address really quickly get a spin entanglement and then remove that and so it's not too long. So things we're talking about clock, let me tell you a few slides to talk about clock in Paris because it, having a single clock is useless. You have to be able to Clock make comparison between clocks to allow you to make measurements or set the time. There are two ways of comparing clock. One is so called a common mode oscillator. You have the same laser derived from two different atomic systems, and you just compare atomic system against atomic system directly that allow you to remove the laser noise out of the test. And so this can allow you to get, to get the best comparison result because the, the, the laser noise, regardless of how well you make it, as long as the system is. Not a, but not a continuous, they always have taken notes, the sample. The other way, the more traditional clock comparison, of course, we are separate local oscillators. We just here to have really physically compared two clocks and you imagine frequency ratio. And this, the first experiment we did back in clock comparison back in 2008 was actually motivated by Victor Feinbaum. He's a High energy particle physicist that turned into the beyond standard model kind of guy in Australia. <laughs> he, he, he travels around to tell people, you know, you can look, look to the north, look to the south, the alpha constant should be different from the universe, and so on. So, so he came in and convinced us we should do this local lens invariance measurement, which is when the Earth is rotating around the sun on an annual basis, the gravitational potential we feel from the sun will change by 5%. So his test was that Jim, why don't you make a clock comparison on a yearly basis and so see if the clock frequency is changing? Wait, sorry, why should it change by five percent? Because the, the, the orbital is not is given. And and so this um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and so 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 at the time, you know, we had a three strontium systems in at one at the University of Tokyo and one in Paris Observatory. Uh, the one involving our lab. We start to compare these clocks, but we cannot really compare optical on clocks. The only thing we can compare clocks is based on GPS as CD clock. At that, at that time, it still is, but I think it will change in the, in the next uh, five, ten years. The optical clock will become the definition of standards. But uh, so, so we can only thing we can do is measure the ratio of strontium against cesium in Boulder, in Paris, in Tokyo, and it is often on top of each other. And that, that gives you some sort of constraints of the possible coupling fundamental potential. At the time, we were publishing values like, and actually, 2008 was the year Ben joined our lab as well. I always remember that as a highlight. Uh, and that was, you know, at the time, we were measuring these linear direct sinusoidal amplitudes constrained at 10 minus 15 level. These days, people are now pushing this to 10 minus 15. So, really, just test by the fundamental constants to use this constant. Uh, whether they can use this to constrain dark matter. And so we have taken this step a little further now. It's like a cesium beam in the middle, which you cannot compare things better than 10 minus 16, because that's the limit of cesium. So we want to start to use optical optical comparison. Here's a fairly recent experiment where we set up optical fiber between gel and the nearest border. And also, we can use our lab is actually somewhere down here in the basement, we can put a fiber all the way up to the, to the top floor and then use, use a telescope to shoot laser onto the NIST building, two kilometers away. And you can use also optical, optical transferring the air to compare clocks. And the both can do that 10 minus 18 level frequency comparison. So that allowed us to compare strontium clock against the clocks like aluminum clock, the sharp iron clock in Dave Wyman's lab, and the utility clock. Uh, Almost student uh, angel level is not staff member there. 
uh, these clocks actually are quite amazing that you can use this uh, sort of out of the lab comparison at the 10 to minus 8. The reason why I want to mention this, if, if this is only two kilometers distance, but if you can extend this distance to 10 kilometers or beyond, which Nate Newberry is not, and yes, is already doing it, then that means you can actually shoot the laser beam up to satellites. Now you can start to talk about clock space uh, comparison. What is it? The satellite is on top of border, we can compare against our clocks. 10 minutes later, it will be. It will be directly above Stanford, and the Mars clock can be compared against that 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 uh, satellite. So that means in ten minutes, all you need is that clock is good enough in the space to be holding holding up for ten minutes. You can start to compare across different ten continents and so on. So this is going to be a really important technology. I know for us, I mean, work on quite serious in, in Europe, in Asia, and across in the U.S. Um, and and it's, it's interesting because you can compare these different atomic species. If you have some, say, theory that saying dark matter is really very light, uh, so it's really like a bosonic field, and it's modulating, for example, coupling to the ordinary matter or ordinary magnetic field, it should cause change of fundamental constants. The Earth is going through a dark matter halo. And so you can use this clock comparison to set the boundary that with, for a certain mass range, this atomic clock comparison is not the best button, or even the clock compared to silicon cavity is providing some of the most stringent bound of the, the coupling strength of the dark matter to ordinary matter. And then, let me come back to the clock comparison where I remove the laser and just do atom atom comparison. And this was actually really motivated by the fact that the atom com confined in the strong optical lattice has two issues. One is very difficult to, to really characterize AC structure at the level below 10 to minus 18. The other is those atoms uh, can still run and scatter photons going to the non clock states, which limits the coherence time. So we start to really think about uh, well, this, was, this experiment was actually built in 2020, so around the pandemic. Uh, we started to build this experiment, and we just went to really, really shallow lattice. A few photon recoils, more than in fact of 10 shallow than any previous so called optical lattice plot. And now this, this is so shallow, you really have to think about the tilt. The tilt is always there, it's gravity, but, but not because it's so shallow, the wave function spreads out. You have to use so called a one and stock function to describe the stationary state. Um, and of course, because we're using this magical wavelengths in steady state, the spin up state has a similar sort of charging potential and the wave function spread out. Now you can think about when you drive these transitions, you can drive on the same site, or you can drive on the neighboring sites, so the wave function spread out. Those are actually, in fact, experimental data looks like line. It's just showing you that when you go to even just a few recoil. The coherence time is incredible. Those are very, very narrow transitions. And the spacing between those is the strontium times gravity times lambda level two. Okay, you think about this, and you know, we are sitting in front of a uh, uh, standing, I mean, not sitting, standing in front of the, the atom interferometer time here, here. This is the gravity measurement, right? This is atom interferometer. And this is atom interferometer. You're spreading the wave function, just holding them there for a long, long time, and recombining them and measure. It does so on the Gaunian stuff side end. The carrier transition itself is right here. This is the So we, we want to go ahead and test how long the coherence time in these sort of very shallow Gaunian stuff lattice is. And we can take an image of the entire crowd, which is about a millimeter long. And we just compare these two samples uh, the top sample versus the bottom sample. And like comparing punch hot and quantum pendulum together. And you can see if you wait for 30 seconds, once you put in coherence composition, you wait for 30 seconds, you have a little ellipse. But telling you that this, this side of the pendulum is oscillating with that side of the pendulum oscillating, there's a slight phase shift that's being developing because there's a frequency difference between the top and bottom. If you wait 50 seconds, you still have coherence because it ellipse hasn't collapsed yet. So it's telling you like, well, finally we can actually approach coherence like about uh, a minute or so, and it's something that has promised. <coughs> and 
that we can do very precise frequency measurements of greenhouse chemicals. And this comes back to the, the, the question where I showed you a single painting. There's a P wave interactions going on next to the frequency share. But now it's interesting that like each individual pancakes, they have identical fermions that interact with them. But between pancakes, now the atoms can, can go back and forth, but I say back and forth, they can interact, so they are actually stationary states. So there's now, between these different pancakes, there's so called spin or coupling effect, where the wavelength of the clock laser is not integer multiples of the separation of the lattice. So, so atoms in this pancake experience different phase shift of the clock laser and that, that, that side, meaning the two spins are not identical and they can start to interact because they are not identical fermions in S wave. So you have suddenly you have S wave, P wave interactions going on in the system and you can tune their relative strength using the, the how deep the track is. And this allows you to tune the interaction to be exactly zero. Uh, and in fact, how zero that is, we always like to find out when you say it can be zero. So how good is that zero? This can actually be as good as 10 minus 20 level of production can be tuned to zero. So this all set up and now we can start to test the so called the redshift. Uh, we have you can think of the upper half is a long clock, the lower half another clock, and just complete a clock comparison. And this goes all the way down to the mid 10 to minus 21 or so. The gravitational relationship from Einstein kind of relativity tells you if you move your if you move your watch 100 microns up or down, the frequency will change fractionally speaking 10 to minus 20. So so we can now start to measure mm -hmm. relationship across just a few hundred microns of distance in the in the sample. And indeed, the, the point I want to always emphasize is not we are making gravitational relationship. That that effect is well known. In some sense, boring even. Uh, but it's the point is the technology we are finally using that we can actually measure these things so precisely, even a few micro tens or hundreds of microns, the frequency is different on these atoms. But that opens the question how far can we push on this? Uh, is it possible, you know, one day, maybe in the next five years, with such a secret gravitational redshift on the scale of quantum mechanical wave function? Suppose about one micron. But if we make our clock another factor of a factor, which probably is going to be challenging, then you start to actually think about if you have entanglement in the vertical direction or entanglement in the horizontal direction, their, their, their evolution dynamics will be different. You will actually be able to see this. That you can actually measure gravitational effect on many body physics. So, in order to do this, we have to come back and learn from Stanford. So if you think about you no know, quantum noise, why people laugh because uh, he knows this stuff. And, but, but we have to get that going you now uh, to really be able to realize that kind of a dream. So come back to this block sphere. You have this position. What are you doing? The clock is measuring the space e to the it, iet. E is the energy difference between each side and ground state. Right? So you want to measure this as well as you can. But this little fuzziness is a quantum noise that is always going to give you this trouble. Um, that's about the standard quantum limit. People have been thinking about this, of course, for a long, long time. You can do lots of samples of atoms, which allow you to push this down as a wall of squared thing. But if you can do spin squeezing and the, the entanglement, and I always think of entanglement is having all these atoms to hide their noise from each other. They have in atoms. In the end, if the noise are somehow conspired to be the covered in entanglement, you only see one copy of the noise instead of square the end copy of the noise. Then you win. Then the scale, the scaling is wall end. And I think that's the biggest gain as far as I can see entanglement can give us is to conceal the quantum configuration from each other. <coughs> and and again, I mentioned you know, there are many people here uh yeah, they have Stanford and have down speed speed. And what can we do? Uh, well, maybe we want to integrate a new system. And this is again, this experiment we actually also built in 2020. Uh, when the pandemic hit, we started like, we are not going to travel anymore. We're just going to build the experiments. <laughs> and, and so this was a cavity. Uh, as, as I was talking with John, we have many people here, including myself, are very passionate about cavities. And they can do many good things. So let's build a high finesse cavity around these atoms. These atoms are in this lattice, but the lattice can be moved up and down like elevator. 
you can put the dose atoms inside this elevator. They can move into the cavity and do spin squeezing experiments and move out with clock numbers. So this is the basic idea that we came up. Um, this remember this is the clock transition, single S0 to triple P0. Uh, we are the cavity QAD is looking on a, a more allowed transition on triple P1. We tune the cavity resonance around triple P1. Essentially, it's like so called QAD, quantum non dimensional measure, using the factors of the collective physics here to tune the cavity onto this particular resonance to spy upon when you put atom in coherence or position between up and down, how much population is actually in the down in a way not destroying the quantum coherence. So only the cavity QAD really, you know, a collective measurement will allow you to do that. But the key thing is you cannot tell which atom is getting you this frequency. And indeed, so we can actually in the you know Ramsey sequence, you can measure before Ramsey as the phase started and after the Ramsey phase has finished, you can measure the you know how much population is in the ground state, how much population in the ground state again, you subtract those. This is the technique Mark and the, and the, and the, um, James Thompson and so on have, have already been doing this for well, several years. So we're using this into this operating the clock. But I think maybe the, our contribution would be really trying to push spin squeezing at the level where it's operating a state of the art. We want to show spin squeezing make a difference, uh, makes a difference at the level of 10 to minus 17 level. It's in a working clock where spin squeezing is showing to the game. Can we can we prove by direct quantum clock comparison that there is a quantum information? So I feel that you know this is an important point because that's the, uh, just like a quantum computer. You know, people people ask you what well, where's the quantum debate? And ten to minus seventeen is not quite state of the art anymore because I was showing the numbers at ten to minus twenty. But just to remind you, know, ten to minus seventeen really is still very excellent uh, clock stability. If you talk about iron clock, it's still at the ten to minus fifteen. It will take ten to four seconds to actually not ten to minus seventeen. <coughs> so, so this is the basic um, platform. We have this elevator with atoms can be moved in and out. So we put a sample in there. We just clock squeeze a spin squeeze operation. They squash the noise down because we spy on where the population is, ground state or side state. We move those atoms out. We put a sample B inside, which is the same spin sweeping operation, here in B now. now you have two spin sweep samples. Now we can ready to do clock spectroscopy. Well, the first thing you do is rotate them by pi over two, such that you're not, because in the end, the random spectroscopy is all about this little phase evolution. How well you can actually see this. This phase. So you want to have this low noise quadrature uh, to be in this uh, in this uh, uh, noise reduced uh, evolution uh, of the of the corporeal plane. Then afterwards, after the Ramsey time has finished, we re-rotate back because now we're going to read out the population. We rotate back into this noise quadrature along the direction, and then you can make a call comparison. And indeed, you know, finally we were able to show that. It, down to like few plus 10 to the 17, the spin squeezing doesn't make a difference. So this is the standard so called quantum projection noise limit. It's limited by the fringe contrast and so on at the moment. So, uh, but nevertheless, there's a 2 dB gain uh, of, of actual clock operation when compared to the So, I hope you know, that with all this uh, discussions, I you know, building a clock is much more than a Piece, it becomes a pro for some bigger piece of science like gravitational waves, dark matter. If these blocks can really reach 10 to minus 20, 10 to minus 21 level of measurement precision. And especially if you can really build a clock network around the, around the Earth, in the end, the clock on our campus won't be good enough. There will be too much geo activity. It really should be in space. Uh, and, uh, you know, of course, you can use the clocks to become a sort of an earth geodesy to measure space time connections, how things are moving around with the ocean surface, and glacial uh, volcanoes, and so on. So, thank you very much. I want to, of course, thank um, graduate students. The uh, three, uh, Quintai is actually a postdoc, uh, Alex and, uh, and Will, the graduate students currently working on this 1D, uh, very, very shallow. Uh, the last one, so that one is not
this is a sweet system, but Christian just left, he's not a faculty member. Lindsay he is a postdoc, and yes, I was still happy this week that he was doing this here. Ross is writing up. If he knocks on your door, Mark, I will want to take him. <laughs> but he is just the most amazing guy. He's from the area, from Berkeley, but was just an amazing guy. He, he was the one who measured this 10 minus 20 type of high ball uh, land shift recently. The silicon cavity uh, group and uh, uh, and sleeping and then just joining us on your career with Oscar. And, and these are three graduate students working on screen screening experiment. Uh, Maya from actually just lab at this graduate new graduate student joining us. Uh, John is also graduate. And then for many years I've collaborated with Jane Andrea Ray on the theory side. But but I have to really give a shout out to James uh, James Thompson who's been collaborating on screen squeezing experiment. With Adam Kaufman, who we talk all the time. Actually, in fact, this group is going to show up some really interesting screen squeezing experiments with tweezers. And then there's Mary Holland and many others, including Peter Zoller and Michelle, who that continue to, to give us ideas on the theory side of blocks, many body physics, really kind of combining the symbol. So, with that, I think that I end here. Thank you very much. I think the tradition is to have students and postdocs go first. Any students go first? Yes. Um, so in, in your like squeezing clock, we have this elevator where you're moving the atoms in yes. out of the cavity. Um, so I guess that can excite the atomic motion when you do before you do the clock probe. So like what level does that come in? Excellent question. This is actually currently what's limiting us. And that's being squeezing. It's the atomic motion being excited a little bit. And so the way to, so instead of having pancakes, what we are thinking about is right now you're moving pancakes and it's kind of two dimensional. Like you said, it's once it once it gets excited, there's a motional coupling to the cavity QED. And that's actually what's ruining us on the on the skin squeezing. And we would love to, you know, right now the Ramsey frame time is only 50 milliseconds. We would like to take up to tens of seconds where skin squeezing can live there. And for that, you, you cannot allow these atoms to be moving around the thermal way. So one idea is instead of pancakes, you make cigars. As soon as you go to cigar, the motion will, even just the fact that the motion can be only done in one D versus two D makes a huge difference. So that's our next thing we actually in fact working on just creating another lattice in this perpendicular direction along the cavity and just turn this into a one D system. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> so once you're able to push into this like precision regime where your gravitational uh, field is like on the same one scale as like the many body wave function, does that allow you to test something non standard like the gravitational decoherence? Or I was just curious. Yeah. No, I think I hear lots of these proposals. Um, I have to say, I don't completely understand a lot of the quantum decoherence, the fact that it's a quiet gravity that people propose where you can have a, you know, there's one thing which is certainly true. If you, you know, Einstein's word line that carries on where you actually know where the position is, right? We know this four dimensional space at xt, and it's always position time is well defined. Quantum mechanically, yeah, yeah. If, if, if you get to that level of precision, you know the trajectory itself is a wave function. So there will be time, that there will be conflict. There's no question. You know, how do you define the time in a way that accommodating a, a wave function which is curved? But, but that maybe you can just solve by you know, this, this, all these quantum mechanics being treated in the curved space. Uh, whether that leads to fundamentally a decoherence that I, uh, Remains to be seen. You know, but I, I, as an experimentalist, I think it's, your, it's maybe within our reach in the next decade where you will see entanglement and so on will, will, have, an, will have an influence because of this curvature. But whether you can say that fundamentally, this, this has nothing to do with quantum gravity as well. The, the, the gravitational field is, a, is a linearized, it's very weak. And so all we are dealing with is, is in that sense that we're looking at the space not curvature. 
One thing actually I've, I've been thinking about, I have the slide. Ben, is it okay to show one more slide? All this taking hour. <laughs> yes, well, since the nice student asked the question. No, what this one one thing is one factor we want to measure, for example, the way the mass of a photon. So you, you know you have atom like this, you you have the photon coming in, you get excited. And of course, the mass of excited atom versus the ground state atom is different by h you know, c squared. And this effect, E equals mc squared, actually, if you put this into a single atom Hamiltonian, this describes everything about this uh, the emotional second order Doppler effect, which is time dilation by motion for gravitational redshift. If you, all you need is to just making sure that the mass has a defect due to the, due to the absorption of photon. And I would love to do actually experiment. I think we can do it, it actually weigh the mass of a single photon. Uh, the, the difference between those two is uh, on the order of 10 to minus 10. Uh, and I think we can actually go through this stock shift, uh, the, the line of stock uh, lattice measurements actually weigh that mass. And once you can do that, this is actually couples to all these Hamiltonians where you can actually derive these in the weak gravity limit, how all these gravitational effects are coming into the antibody uh, Hamiltonian. But I don't want to get in there, that would take too long. <laughs> but we are actually working with theorists already. Uh, with actually Peter Zoller and somebody in, in Hanover and then we are equal cost and so on for bringing to this kind of thing. Yeah, I have a very practical technical question as well. So if I understand what you explained here that the achievement refinement of clock accuracy uh, is coming from Pleasing, which is the collective effect, collective effect involved, and keeping the atoms apart in a controlled way. Yes. So that you can control how they interact. That's right. Now, that means you can't do it with one. You need atoms. You, you, need, you need a lot of atoms. You need a lot of atoms. You yes. Need, you need to cohere the atoms. In. That's correct. And they're going in both opposite directions, right? The more atoms you have to control, the harder it is. Now, here's my question. Your ability to do that is coming from the extreme mass of the apparatus. In other words, your ability to take classical physics and the acoustics and the quantum system is actually borrowing the property of the apparatus that, that you would say in common language is the apparatus is very heavy. Mm -hmm. Now, that will work if the darn thing is on the ground or in a satellite, but, uh, but what about? Portable clocks. What about things the defense department really cares about? Uh, are we talking these incredible accuracies with that kind of clock, or is there a practical limit here? Uh, just the fact that the apparatus is not, you know, it's got vibrations and it's not infinitely dense and infinitely dense. Yeah. So your, your, your question actually raises, um, in some sense, touching on the actual very forefront of our field. On two, on two sides. One, yes, more atoms is always better. You know, it, even if you don't have this thing just the fact you can do such an incredible quantum state control individual and putting them together. That's at the core of, I would say, quantum information process in general. When people tell you they need to do a quantum computer, you, you, they cannot just give you two atoms. They have to, they have to scale them up. And it's this, con, this tension between the more systems you have, the bigger the scaling up the system is, how well you can scale like this precise control. That's that's really is a unified theme of technology of worrying all of this. Um, but that's what that's actually that kind of the field is moving forward compared to 10 years ago. We have a lot more items that are under control than that. And, and it, so that's one. But the, the second point you make. I would actually argue that this is just a tremendous opportunity. I was talking to your business students. I don't know if you guys go here. Um, this morning, you know, whether you can, large part of our apparatus, apparatus is in fact, is laser, are lasers. And if we can have integrated photonics to replace lasers we have in the lab, the system will be much more compact. The mass, I don't think it, it, at the moment really enters the equation yet. Like the vibration model, yet those are technical models we have to solve. But my vacuum apparatus is still many, many, many of those magnitude heavier than this individual atom. Even if I have one billion atoms, there's still nothing with my apparatus. 
And so that's not really the limitation, but you do have to be clear where the technical noise are from. And, and, and it's possible. Yeah, people are not thinking about how do I integrate atoms onto chips with the photon. That's a very technically challenging. Um, so I feel like a lot of like this really kind of, kind of um, pioneering state of the art you know, clockwork has been done you know, with strontium eighty seven and similar like narrow line optical transition. Yes. Um, I'm curious how much mileage do you think we can kind of keep getting um, on you know, strontium eighty seven on like, the six ninety eight line and on kind of similar transition, um, and whether you have any thoughts on on whether whether you know. At some point, we will have to, you know, switch to like another species. I've heard people like start to think about thorium. Um, yeah, and the, yes, yeah. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, whether you see, um, you know, in the near midterm, like whether people will start having to you know, transition to kind of pushing further, or whether we can kind of keep waiting for a long time on front. Well, if you if you show me the nuclear transition, we can switch tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> People haven't found it, but they are, they are, search, search is going on. Search is going on. But uh, your, your point is very well taken. Is that you know the coherence time of two minutes is great, but as you all know, I, I don't like the writing so much. You have certain finite patients, so you know, the last, and you cannot just say I'm going to harvest the, the coherence which is ten years. Uh, you, what you want is to go to higher transition. But it's like, you know, if you think about a mountain clock, which has a coherence of not one second, between 20 seconds, 30 seconds, well, that's a fact of 10 gain. But what we really gained was our frequencies were working million times higher than the microwave frequencies. So, so there is the goal that if you go to higher frequency, if you go to nuclear transition, but you still have this precise quantum state control where coherence time can be a minute, you win big time. Because you don't have to be as patient. Now, and this is actually the same thing about the quantum computer you want to do. In, in principle, when I say, oh, I see bipolar transitions with one to 20 second coherence time, the physics is all the same, it's universal. But in terms of the speed to show this effect, the stronger transition gave you the faster speed. Does that answer the question? Or? Yeah, just curious about your thoughts. <coughs> so, um, you have this nice you know, conveyor belt bringing the atoms in and out of the cavity, which is great for squeezing, but I guess also gives you a way potentially to partially read out the system. I'm yes, so that's actually how we do read out. Yeah. yeah, I guess I'm wondering whether there are applications of that to um, uh, you know, eating laser phase noise and extend, or extending the coherence time beyond the coherence time of the laser or eating the dip effect continuously that you run in the clock. Yeah, if, we don't, if one can really build a continuous system, right now the system is still shot based you know, yeah. we have to collect atoms. But you know, I've actually been advocating if, if some company, some company, I'm not really looking at any particular person, but if somebody's company produces <laughs> a continuous that the whole atom source of strontium, absolutely. This, you know, you ideally you just let it go all the time. Because it goes going through the cavity, you can actually have you can have a full high cavity. The first cavity coming spin squeeze the next cavity, you know, both high cavity. The same cavity can act as spin squeezer, but also read out. And it just continuously still, still put. Would be amazing. Yeah. And that would actually be another big phase of improving clock technology. But we don't have this uh, not in principle technology wise, you can we can just do that. Okay, well let's thank June and